about that. <laughs> Welcome back to the Noel Castler podcast, episode 110, if I put this out. I didn't mean to play that long. I just heard Dwayne Eddy passed away. And Dickie Betts passed away since the last time I've done this, so I had to pull out the electric one of them. Nice PRS. I'll get to talking in a minute. Sorry, guys. This is Noel. This is the Noel Castler podcast. This is me. Sometimes I play too long in the beginning. I'll put it down, I promise. Um, welcome back. Has anything been happening in the news since last time we spoke? That's the only thing I'm wondering. Um, obviously, a lot's happening. It feels like we're, you know, heading into, you know, a period of even greater tumult, if that seems at all, at all possible because it's obviously been a pretty uh, crazy ride these last few years. And I appreciate all your kind, kind comments when I, when I do these things. I know I don't do them regularly. I'm going to try to be better about that. Last week's or last you know time I did this was very uh, well received, and I appreciate that. One of my idols watches or listens to the show and retweeted it, and she responded to, the thing I'd said about being creative, like you don't have to be Taylor Swift, just do something you enjoy doing it. Like just what I was doing there at the beginning. Like there's a lot of clam notes. I don't know what I'm playing. I'm just picking it up and I enjoy the sound. And there's a lot of stuff inside of me from the day and it's a way to let it out. And it doesn't have to be music. It can be drawing, it can be writing, it can be gardening, it can be cooking, it can be, you know, playing with your dog, you know, anything where you're just joyful or even if not joyful, if you're engaged with yourself and your soul, you're benefiting the planet. And, uh, you know, I said you don't have to be Taylor Swift, and it was Jane Lynch who retweeted that. I don't like to name drop, but one of my idols, one of the greatest actors this country's ever produced, in my opinion, you know, a master uh, at completely committing to a character, but but still, like, chewing up the scenery in a fun way, you know, with all her skill as an actor and a commitment, there, there's a joyfulness in everything she does. And uh, it translate when, translates when you're watching it and it takes you on a journey, you know, and, and it, it's, it's real art. I mean, some of the lines that she said live with me, you know, and when I'm down, I need to remind myself of them. Most recently, Mrs. Maisel, there's a line after the character she plays loses all her fortune and stuff, and and she's like, I took a taxi. <laughs> you know? And there's another scene where she's like mad at these guys are talking about how broke she is, and she's like, you know, I had to eat dog food, you know. Dog, or dog food's not that bad, you know. And uh, at the end of the meeting, she's like, don't you want to know why I said dog food isn't that bad? You know, and it, that would have been a throwaway line with a lesser actor and and she just nails it and it's a line where the scene is ending and she's kind of you know going out the door and it's just delivered with that full commitment you know every word has a purpose every moment has a purpose and, and you know the greatest performers are, are always in the moment and Jane Lynch is somebody like I've never seen her work I met her on a charity event or something at NBC I think it was Red Nose Day it was called it Something. I remember how kind she was, and she took a picture with all the Rockettes I was working with. I think, I think that was the same gig. But um, and I worked with Glee on the inauguration, but I don't think she was there. But anyway, I've observed her behind the scenes, and she's quite a kind person. But as a performer, I've never seen her work, but I can imagine that her level of intensity is a high one because you don't you don't get that kind of uh, performance otherwise. And by intensity, I mean investing in the moment. You know, I, I've talked about this before, but I, I obviously, you know, I, I got to work with Springsteen a lot. I've been his handler many times on TV shows, and I worked on the reunion tour, uh, the the New York, like, uh, the thing we made a movie about with Jonathan Demme. It, it's live in New York City or something, it was called. It was 2000, 
and it was the end of the reunion tour and he was coming back to New York and it was this triumphant run, you know, uh, putting the band back together and they were going to play 10 nights at the end of June, early July. And it was, you know, Springsteen's my hero. I first saw him, one of them, I saw him in 1985. And I've told that story in my live show where he was given a monologue or telling this, you know, thing before the river. And he made me embarrassed, like, dude, I don't know you that well. Why are you revealing such an intimate thing about your life? And then I looked around and there were 75,000 people at Giant Stadium. And I'm like, he just made me feel that way. And I'm up here on the third, you know, ra rail, rafter or whatever, uh, tier. And, uh, and I realized there was magic in that, right? And this wasn't even like, he hadn't even rocked out. This wasn't in the, in, the, in the poetry of the song yet. This was just the thing that he had crafted to share and reveal of himself. And he'd obviously, you know, it was the end of the tour, right? He'd born in the USA tour in, in this circumstance. And he'd been on the road for a year and a half. Had the biggest album, in, you know, in the world for a, long, a good chunk of that time. And uh, the reason it wasn't stale right? Because he was, he was in the moment when he was saying it every time. So it was like this mystery to me. And that was the beginning of, of kind of studying that sort of thing as a performer. And I went to, I went to the a drama school in New York City where they taught Meisner, which is moment to moment, you know. And uh, so when I'm working on the reunion tour, I'm about I graduated in 96 from drama school, so I'd been out of drama school about four years. So I, I was familiar with being in the moment, and I, I'd watch him. And, and every night during the concert, at some point, I'd be like, because it was so intense, and I got to be, you know, I could watch from where, wherever I want. I could walk in by the front row. I could walk by Danny Federici, you know. <laughs> like, I, you know, I had the run of the place. So I would just watch him every night because I was a huge fan. I, I was supposed to be doing other things, <laughs> but I would watch as much of the show as I could. And at, at, every night there'd, there'd come a point where I would say, oh, he's, he's like, this is his last show. Like, he just hasn't told us yet, but after the concert, he's going to come back and tell the band and his crew and everybody like, yeah, sorry, I got to, you know, whatever such and such happened, that was the last gig. I'm never doing this again. Because he would reach a point of intensity every night that he tricked me you know and, and i knew there was more to come right i knew we were coming back the next night but he fooled me as a fan at a certain point every night so i would watch him i'm like how does he do this and what i surmised was it was just the intensity you know it was just how deeply he invested in the moment right because a lot of the stuff was scripted you know, very scripted i don't mean that in a negative way i mean a polished it's an act he's a performer right the guy you see on stage the boss that's a persona you know i've worked with him on other times and he just sits in his dressing room and reads all day he's a very thoughtful writerly guy the rest of the time and off stage i don't want to talk about you know his personal life which i don't know that much and i'm not at liberty to do but i've observed him enough in other circumstances that, and he he talked about it in his memoir, it's an act, he developed that, you know, and he works at it very hard. He would show up and sound check the band for like two hours. You're talking like show eight at the end of a tour. They've been on the road for two years, you know, and, and, and there's two shows left and they're off for a year and he's making everybody rehearse for two hours. And Jackson Brown was like that too, who they're, they're quite, you know, close, obviously. Uh, peers and, and kind of came up at the same time. Bruce actually opened for Jackson, I think, at the Child Herald or something in D.C. way back. And, and those two camps, I've, I've been privy to crossing paths with, with the two of them and being a fly on the wall. But it's the same sort of work ethic, right? That moment to moment comes from preparation and, and rising to the occasion and honoring the privilege that it is to perform and that's something special. And that's why an artist like that has longevity. That's why somebody like Taylor Swift, you know, to bring her up is, is connecting with her fans in such a way and, and you know, and, and taking it to another level, right? The music's not my music. It's not aimed at me. It's not supposed to be. I, I haven't dug into it enough, but I'm a fan of who she is, who I've observed. I worked with her plenty of times on TV shows and she always, you know, brought her a game she was a class act she always took care of the crew and everybody you know she just gave away like 55 million dollars in bonuses 
to, to, to the crew. Nobody's done that before. Like Bruce and those guys, you know, I got a bonus. <laughs> you get bonuses on tours, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, you'd get a bonus. Not the level of money she's giving away. She, she's changing the game. And good for her. Good for her. Um, so the point of that is, like, you don't have to be a star, right? Because anybody can emulate that kind of commitment. That moment-to-moment -moment stuff is available to you. It's about getting out of your head, you know, getting out of your own way. That's where the, the good stuff comes from is, like, you know, you, you prepare a lot and then you let go. And, and if you pick up a process, you know, doing some kind of arts or crafts or whatever it is, you'll find it that it takes on a life of its own. You know, the more time you put in and the more you commit to it, it'll reveal things to your to you about yourself that you wouldn't have known otherwise, and you'll be a better person for it, right? And the world will be a better place if you're a better person and you're more in touch with that because it'll breed empathy and it'll breed an understanding in the arts of... Uh, you know, what the mission truly is, right? You have an opportunity to touch lives and to help people and, uh, you know, and entertain them. It doesn't have to be that complicated, right? Stand-up comedy is, is making people laugh most of the time. So that's my little rant on the arts. It's a, it's a you know, it's a tangent that I'm starting off with, but uh, it's important. And even if you're just journaling or, or you know, the morning pages is, Julia Cameron's a friend of mine, if you guys are familiar with The Artist's Way. It was a book that came out, and she's the one who got me back into my creative kind of flow when I got, when I first came in, you know, to recovery 18 years ago. She was like, you need to write, you need to get back to your art and stuff. And uh, that was a gift. And she writes about doing the morning pages where you just get up every morning and you write two or three pages, and it doesn't matter what it is. Just write anything that comes you know, to your head, you get in the habit of, of writing it down and uh, you'll find that it'll it'll clear away the, the junk so you can get to more truths. And it may take a long time. You may do it for 10 years before you find any gold. And the gold may not be what you think it is. It may not be a bestseller or a completed novel. It may just be learning something about yourself. You know, I, I write a lot and I was writing, I'm writing this thing it's like a novel, but it has to do with my own life. And there was a point in my life where my dog ran. I don't even want to get into this. <laughs> you read the book, okay? It's too long a story to tell you right now. But I was writing about that thing, and, and then I, I discovered another connection, you know, uh, to something else and then something that was sort of motivating me that I hadn't been conscious of. And I only found it by that peeling the onion of self-exploration. And it's like they say, you know, like an unexamined life is a life not worth living. And, and, and a creative process is a good way to begin to examine yourself and examine, you know, the world we live in. So I didn't mean to just take the first 10 minutes of this talking about that, but I think that's important, right? Because we're dealing with things now that, that, that require an understanding that our, our current kind of makeup and, and the, the way everything is on social media and the way news works now and the way everything's monetized and people are, you know, trying to constantly come up with content, you know, content it can, become, can become more important than truth, right? Because you have these algorithms and these things like, congratulations, you reached so many more people. You should do that again right now. Like maybe you're not ready to do it right now. Maybe you don't have anything to say yet. Maybe you need to protect, you know, the, the the space that you're operating in a little more but that stuff can manipulate things right and they can it can be like things can can kind of catch fire in a way where something larger is at work and, and not in a good way like you know sort of a psychological phenomena that can you know could spin out of control and, and we're we're on the brink of spinning out of control in, in, in a lot of ways right I, like Let's be honest, you know, Biden's still behind in, in the polls, which, you know, might get worse after after all these protests and stuff. You know, he's, he's kind of taking a hit for that. And uh, that sucks. You know, it's going to suck if the, you know, if 68 convention redux in Chicago this year, I'll be there in August. And uh, 
you know, that's going to be a bad look if a bunch of people are in the streets protesting. And I'm not saying don't protest. I'm not saying don't be outraged about what's happening in Gaza. But, you know, check yourself and learn all the facts because there's a lot of anti-Semitism getting thrown in the mix. There's a lot of outside agitators. And we live in a different world. It's not 1968. I worked for Crosby, Stills & Nash. I'm, I'm well aware of, of you know, the protest movements in this country, you know, Pete Seeger was somebody I knew and talked to and worked with, you know, my grandmother, you know, steeped me in that stuff. She hung out with the radical priests, you know, Philip Berrigan, Daniel Berrigan, the anti-war Jesuit priest protesters, like, you know, I come from a place of left-wing progressive politics. What we're witnessing now is something a little different. I haven't seen that before, you know, and you guys need a better soundtrack. That's the first thing I'll tell you, right? <laughs> I need some Country Joe and the Fish. <laughs> I need some better songs, okay? Where's your Bob Dylan, you know? Uh, maybe it's Taylor Swift, but <laughs> my, I'm, I'm, I'm making light of a serious situation. The point I'm trying to make is it's not 1968. We're, we're, you know, we're a heavily armed country now, and all we need is some Yahoo Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, freak to come out and, and open fire on a crowd, and it's going to spin out of control and it's going to get really ugly. And what we saw last night in UCLA was really ugly. And I don't know the whole picture. I've seen two sides clashing, and I don't want to see people fighting. You know, that's not nonviolence. That's not peaceful protest. I'm not taking a side on who started it or whatever. I know that's up to debate, and I, I'm, that's not my point. My point is that ain't the way. Violence ain't the way. The prophets we've all had have led us down a different path, okay? Bob Marley, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, you know, peaceful protest is a very powerful thing. Breaking up an administrative building, taking over a hall, you know, damaging property. That ain't, that ain't it. That might have worked in 68. You know what I mean? But we're not in 1968. You saw that last night with the MIP coming in. And they behave professional. You know, some of you guys might not want to hear that, but I know a lot of cops. I've worked with a lot of cops and I've worked on crowd, big crowd events. You know, I did the, the tree lighting every year for a long time, like 15 years. I did the ball drop since the 90s. You know, I've done a lot of big events in New York, 9-11 ceremonies. The cops they had showing up at Columbia, those guys are trained. Those guys know what they're doing, and they acted with professionalism last night. Whether or not you think they should have been on campus, you know, that's not the point I'm making. They were called in, and they had to do something. They had to take the building. You know, you can't just do that. But they behaved well, they weren't thugs, you know, they weren't just going in there and cracking heads. That can happen, and we've seen that happen, and we don't want that to happen further. And I know there's incidents, you know, already where the cops are kind of, you know, going ballistic, and uh, we, don't, we don't need that. We need to de-escalate. We need to work towards peace, and we need to work towards understanding, and we need to find other ways um, to approach these issues online. I'm not saying don't protest. I'm saying what we're doing right now is, is not heading in a good direction, okay? And, and Trump is telling you who he is, right? He gave a Time Magazine interview. He said, look, I'm going to be a dictator. <laughs> the, the country's going to be all about me if I get reelected. I've learned from the last time. You know, he said it. I didn't, he didn't know what he was doing. He was a joke. He was more surprised than anyone that he won, that it worked. You know, Kushner had a plan. He fed the stuff through Russia, through, you know, Konstantin Kalimnik, who was, who was a friend of Paul Manafort. It's a business associate, not a friend, right, who was paid. So, you know, Manafort took campaign data, passed it to Kalimnik. Kalimnik passed it to, the, you know, the guys that Putin had in charge of psyops and trying to interfere with our elections. One of them was that thug who got shot down in the plane, the general who freaked out and, and went after Putin. Remember that guy <laughs> when he was marching on Moscow? But um, my point is there was a, a, a big operation bigger than Trump and it delivered him 
uh, the election in 2016. And if you look at him that night, he was as scared as anybody, you know, or shocked or scared, you know, because he was like, oh, my God. And he knows how many skeletons he has in his closet. Right. And he went to D.C. and he caused a lot of chaos and he stuffed a lot of money in his pockets. But he was basically a moron and he's still a moron. But now he's a moron with experience and he's a moron who's smart enough to know what didn't work last time, what he didn't get away with, why he's on trial now, and he'll make damn sure certain that that doesn't happen to him again, and he'll have guys around him making sure it doesn't happen. You know, There were some checks and balances last time. As crazy as it seemed, there was still some institutional pushback. There was people who were like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, People at DOJ, people at Department of Defense, all kinds of people you know, had some, you know, put some breaks on some of his wilder things. And I think people forget about all the crap he wanted to do. He wanted to build a moat next to the wall and fill it with alligators and snakes. <laughs> you know, he wanted to paint the wall black and put spikes on the top to burn people's hands when they were trying to climb over it. There was all these, you know, medieval things that he was dreaming up. He wanted to shoot protesters across the street from the White House in Lafayette Park. And, and, I think it was Millie who was, was like, no, you can't do that. He's like, well, can we shoot him in the knees? Like this, this guy was seriously saying this because he was embarrassed that he'd been called out for going into the bunker, you know, for the George Floyd protest, which, by the way, had outside agitators that came and got it all crazy, right? The guys starting the fires and doing all that stuff, those are probably right-wing guys that had infiltrated so they could blame it on Antifa. And that's what I'm saying now. Be careful of what's happening because there's powers at work here that, that I don't think all these kids are aware of. And I think, you know, they're right to be outraged about, you know, I'm not talking about that. There's legitimate horrors going on in the world and you should use your voice and, and use your right to protest and free speech to make change in this world. This world needs that. What it doesn't need is big incidents that are being manipulated by bad actors that want to put Trump back in office. And I promise you this situation is custom made for that, if not engineered at some level for that to happen. Because right away after October 7th, if you were online, there was a bot army of trolls, you know, attacking people, pumping up the anti-Semitism. And it's that way still. OK, so there's, you know. Putin's got a big uh, incentive to make sure that these protests get worse and, and get out of control. And we don't want that to happen. That's not what a democracy is. And Trump doesn't want a democracy. He wants to be an authoritarian. And, and he will. He will be. <laughs> and he said that in Time magazine. You know, he wants to regulate women's health. He wants to regulate their pregnancies to find out if they had an abortion so he can punish them. You know, real draconian, draconian you know, just sadomasochistic, awful things. That's what he'll do. And, and you should believe him because he's a horrible human being, as I've said on 109 episodes of this podcast, right? He was a horrible human being when I worked on Celebrity Apprentice. His family are horrible. His immediate family, his children and stuff, you know, adult children. I, don't, I never met his youngest kid. I, I'm none of my business. I'm talking about Jared, I'm talking about Vonky, I'm talking about Eric, I'm talking about the cokehead. Like, these are not good people. There's not a lot of morals in Mar-a-Lago, okay? It's filled with scumbag billionaires trying to suck up to the worst guy you've ever met, who's drug-addled, you know, who's snorting Adderall and reading Fox, you know, seeing what Fox News is saying about him and, and acting out of resentment. As I've explained to you, he's, he's the most vengeful person I've ever met. You know, he doesn't forget a slight because he's so deeply, deeply insecure. And these trials are sort of, you know, the cases and the trial that he's in, particularly now, right? It's the only one we're witnessing besides E. Jean Caro, who he's still disparaging, who he totally assaulted, and everybody knows that. But the trial now, you know, he's fallen asleep. That's because he's on benzos, because he can't snort Adderall in the morning because he's got to be in court. He's a mess before noon. When he worked in the White House, he wouldn't show up until the Oval Office 
until noon, and they called it executive time, right? Which was the White House staff enabling dysfunction, enabling a drug addict. He's not functional enough to get to the most important job in the world besides being a teacher or a nurse, right? By 7, 8 a.m., right? If you're president of the United States, you should be at your desk at least by the time somebody who works at, you know, on Wall Street is at their desk, right? But he wasn't. He was upstairs watching Fox News, doing his hair, putting on his makeup, strapping into his girdle, snorting some rails, you know, because he knew he'd go downstairs and they'd give him a briefing that he wouldn't read, that he wouldn't pay attention to. And then he'd call in Hope Hicks, you know, and Sarah Sanders and say, I got a problem. You know, this David Pecker guy's about to run an article, you know, on, on this playmate I was banging last year. And I need you guys to to get on that for me, right? That's what we're seeing revealed in this trial, right? He was in the Oval Office figuring out how to catch and kill stories about his lovers, you know, and his porn star that he slept with, Stormy Daniels. I don't like that term. I'm not trying to disparage her. She's an adult film actress, you know, but that's what he was, when he should have been doing the business of the people, that's what he was doing. And that's who he always was. You know, scandal follows that guy his whole life because he's, you know, he's not just a cad. He's not like a womanizer. He's a deviant. He's a predator, right? And, and he's a messy guy and he needs sleazy lawyers to clean up his messes and sleazy media people. And that's who he is behind the scenes. And it's coming out, right? It, it's going to get a lot worse as this trial goes on and he knows it. So it's amping up that rage in him. And you don't want to give him an opportunity to act out that rage. You know, we, we want to send him to jail. We don't know if we're going to get that opportunity because it looks like the Supreme Court is going to, you know, side with him. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's been paying attention, right? Leonard Leo walked into the Trump office on Fifth Avenue, you know, his crappy office with the janky furniture. You know, they had to rent furniture when The Apprentice began because it was so threadbare. What was in there is a very mom and pop operation. Most people think he was running some big empire. He wasn't. Trump organization was a licensing company. It was a branding thing. They would loan their name. Somebody else would put up the building and, you know, they'd slap some stupid Trump on with gold letters on the side. So it was a pretty small operation. Right. And when they went in there to film him as this big genius, film him as this big genius, Burnett and the production company had to hire furniture. I wasn't on that. I didn't do it until the celebrity showed up. <laughs> but my buddies that were audio guys were like, you wouldn't believe what it looked like when we first went in there. So he's not coming from like a, a, a big operation. He's coming from a private company where he could get away with stuff like that, you know, with being a scumbag. And then he went to the White House and he had to clean up his tracks, you know, being a scumbag. And, and now all his, you know, all his stuff has been exposed, so he knows the judiciary, if, if left as it is, will end up ultimately throwing him in jail. So he's hoping to win. He's hoping the Supreme Court, at the very least, will wait till June to, to give us a decision in his immunity case, in which case they're basically handing him the opportunity to throw the trial away after the, the election because there won't be enough time left to uh, to bring the case, so he's in a he's in a very favorable favorable position right now. The case he's in, notwithstanding, which hopefully he'll lose. But even that, he's only got to get one juror with reasonable doubt, and there's like five or six guys on the on the jury. I don't I don't trust anything about that, but he's obviously guilty of this stuff, and I think the prosecution is going to make a great case. So let's just assume he loses that. You know, but he doesn't stand trial in the other cases. He goes into November strong. He goes into November saying, you know, they came at him with this witch hunt and nothing really stuck and it got delayed. And, you know, they're going to do what they plan on doing. They've hired 100,000 workers, right? Lawyers and, and poll workers and, and just thugs, basically, MAGA people to show up at poll stations and intimidate voters. He's already ahead in some of these swing states. He needs to pull off a Wisconsin, you know, a Pennsylvania, Michigan, a couple of counties, you know, Arizona. What do we do in Arizona when, when they're like, no, Trump won, Biden didn't win. No, I'm not showing you the ballots. Like, there's all these whack jobs, 
that are making themselves secretary of states. They're getting on the local election boards. They're making all kinds of rules that are going to benefit Trump. And these guys are out of their minds. If you watch Rachel Maddow, she does really good deep dives on this stuff. And it's been terrifying to watch it. Because essentially he's running a cult. He, he started a cult. Like these people, he's a religious figure to them. He's manipulated, you know, culturally deprived people that are drawn to his brand of, you know, trashy white supremacy, right? Thinking that they're going to aspire to be like him if they follow him. And the second he's elected, he doesn't need those people anymore. They're gone to him because he never needs the votes again. He doesn't need to get elected again. He's king. He can just make Vonky the queen next time, you know, or hand it off to Jared, you know, or Ron DeSantis. If he cuts a deal with somebody like that, which is the other part of this thing, like who's he going to pick as his VP? I don't care. It's not going to be the dog killer anymore. I guarantee you that, right? But he's going to pick somebody that might give him an advantage in some of those states, either financially, you know, or, or with an electoral college, you know, couple of votes. Ron DeSantis, there, there'd be, you know, there'd be a question of that with, with electoral votes. Like he... he He's in a better position than he should be right now. Let me just make that point, right? I don't want to belabor it, but I'm not, you know, I think Biden's going to win, even though the poll numbers have him slightly behind. I don't think they're going to accept Biden winning, and I think they're going to have improved upon their plan that they tried to enact last time, improved upon their coup to the point that it may be overwhelming to the the system and it may spark a constitutional crisis that that plays out very quickly you know and before we know it we have this idiot saying he's president you know or he could just win outright you know like we all had to witness on october's you know or november's you know 2016 which which you know as i said obviously there was a lot of russian help but we didn't really go back and make a case for that very well Mueller tried and just was not the right guy for the job and the way it was presented. And you had Bill Barr obfuscating, right? Five weeks before anybody else got to read the report, he's out there saying there was no, you know, collusion, no interference with Russia, which was all bullshit, right? But Bill Barr is a paid professional liar and fixer for the Republican Party. I don't know if you saw Bill Barr the other night on CNN. He was on CNN Saturday night. He's like, yeah, he's a total scumbag. But yes, of course I'd vote for him again because Biden's a disaster. Biden's not a disaster. Bill Barr's opus day, right? He, he's, a, he's a guy who considers himself an elite Catholic kind of, you know, master of the universe. And whatever kind of, you know, stuff he has to do behind the scenes to, 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 to you know, to attain his objection or, or objective of, of having men like him in power, he'll do it. You know, we got the Iran-Contra guys off. Right. He, he's a bad dude as an AG. He's a CIA guy. His dad was, you know, knee deep in Epstein stuff. I've talked about that crap on here plenty. I don't want to keep doing it. But, you know, he was a guy punching hippies at Columbia. He was a bully at Horace Mann where he went to uh, high school. It's a very fancy prep school in New York City. He went to uh, Corpus Christi on the Upper West Side before that, which is also where uh, uh, the great comedian who passed away that everybody loves. I saw him when I was in high school. His name is escaping me. Went there as well. And it's, it's unbelievable to think of those two guys at the same high school. I don't think they were the same age. Um, somebody's going to have to tell. George Carlin. So that's where Carlin went to high school, or elementary school. Um, Bill Barr was punching hippies at Columbia, anti-war protesters. You know, he's always been this straight-laced asshole. And, and we're... We're suffering for these men now. Alito was a little prick at Princeton who resented the riots and the unrest, you know, that happened in Newark. He was a middle-class Italian guy from Newark. He resented, you know, the, 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 the strife of black people fighting for their rights. He didn't like that. He had a, you know, a chip on his shoulder about being basically a poor kid at Princeton with all these rich guys, so he got attracted to money. That's why he sucks up to anybody, like, who's going to offer him some, <laughs> you know? Koch brothers, Harlan Crow. You know, these men have their hands out. Clarence Thomas, these are venal men. These are men that you can buy. You don't want people that are motivated by money sitting on the, 
you know, the highest court in the land. Trust me. And that's, Republicans are motivated by money. Money is power, and they have a lot of it, and they have a lot of power, a lot more power than you think you have. You know, our power lies in unity. Our, la our power lies in the truth, in the democratic process. And it's that process itself that's under attack right now. And I don't think enough focus is being put on that. And I think a lot of these other things, distraction isn't the right word, but, you know, there, there's a bit of subterfuge going on uh, on the international stage, or at least the, you know, our, our stage as it relates to the world at large, right? You take the GOP reluctance to fund Ukraine. That bill should have been passed in October. They've left those guys hanging over there for an entire winter. If you read about what's happening in eastern Ukraine, these guys are, you know, they're getting slaughtered. It's a horrific situation, and they were almost out of bullets. And the bullets we just sent them got blown up tonight in Odessa, by the way, a bunch of, you know, rounds of ammunition. It's a disaster. You know, Putin is bombing, you know, beautiful, like, castles. I'm sure you saw the video. You know, he's a terrorist. He's dropping bombs on people, and he had the full support and backing of the Republican Party basically since the beginning of the war, and certainly for the last six months until they finally passed this bill. You know, and Speaker Johnson had to basically go against the radical elements of his party, your MTGs, you know, and your you know, Rand Pauls and all these psychopaths, Rands in the Senate, but, you know, the, the folks in the House that were blocking it and the, the folks in the Senate that, that still didn't vote for the, the package. So it's scary. And, and they're carrying water for a dictator in Russia because they'd like to see that replicated. And if Trump takes office, that's what you'll see. The model and the plan has always been to sort of engineer the United States like Russia, like a kleptocracy. That's what Jared Kushner was working on, because that sounds very good to a guy like Kushner, because he's the boss's son-in-law, right? He, he wants to, to mete out who gets the resources of our country. That, that's what oligarchs are in Russia, right? The guys who controlled, you know, Oleg Deripaska, Rusal, the guys who controlled the resources and the industry, industry of the country were the ones who proffered, profited if they stayed in favor of Putin, you know? And Putin didn't invent the oligarchs. There was oligarchs, you know, before him, obviously, Beresloff, you know? That was the, the main guy that Putin kind of pushed out who, who had propped up the drunk before Putin, you know, Yeltsin and stuff. So there's actually a great play about that right now called Patriots on Broadway, which you should see if you're in New York. It's phenomenal, and there's a, a really brilliant way they've dramatized the whole thing and showed how Putin came to power and how these wealthy men went along with it because they got to control the resources. And, and that's what, that's the model that Trump and these guys will work off of. You know, if you play ball with the boss, if you give him his peace and you stay, you know, you stay in good standing, you'll prosper. If you don't, you'll get punished. And like I said, he doesn't care about the rank and file voters. He'll use the MAGA army to socially kind of, you know, police this country, right? It'll get real conservative real quick. All these yahoos and their pickup trucks with their Trump flags, they'll be, they'll be walking around living large, right? Pushing back against the elements they don't trust. And he'll basically deputize them to do that because he'll round up 11 million immigrants, right? Many Middle Eastern of Middle Eastern descent and Hispanic and Latinos, right? So he'll make anybody like that suspect. Once he says that's the policy of our land, you'll have people taking it on themselves to, in, you know, enforce those rules. You know, let me see your papers, buddy. That kind of shit. The last thing we need, the last thing we want, right? And that's his whole platform, that xenophobic hatred because because that'll keep those kind of people happy and feeling like they're involved and that's half his grift right is, is like you're helping me come to dc that's why he's pissed now because none of them are showing up in new york you know because it's cold out and they don't know how to get to you know center street or wherever <laughs> the courthouse is right they're not going to show up in lower manhattan they don't want to pay for those tolls you drive in from pennsylvania it's a long trip nowhere to park he's in the wrong spot to have him show up, but they will show up for him in other instances, and especially if he gets elected again, right? And that's what he wants to do. He'll pardon the January 6th people right away, so that'll show 
hey, you do something in my name, you're good to go. And that'll have a lot of appeal, especially when you make heroes and martyrs out of those people, which he's obviously doing at his rallies. You know, singing the January 6th anthem and all this crazy shit, which he's playing at Mar-a-Lago, by the way. That timepiece opened with a scene of him eating in the dining room. And uh, it's not a scene, it's real. And he pulls out his iPad and he controls the music. And on his playlist is, <laughs> is the January 6th choir singing the national anthem. I mean, if that's not the stuff of nightmares, you know, if you can't picture yourself eating Costco shrimp, you know, in the dining room at Mar-a-Lago, and when he walks in, they all applaud. They all stop what they're doing and applaud. Nothing would make me rent, wretch harder than witnessing that, <laughs> you know? And that's what's going down. That's what one of my writing projects is like a satirical, you know, literature way to write about, you know, t to tell some of this stuff, you know, the real stuff that's happening, the guys that are showing up there, you know, and already currying favor. And you can see them circling their wagons, right? That's why Barr was saying that. He was sing signaling to the other arch conservatives and the other Opus Dei people and the other, you know, Koch brother, finance bros, the people that understand that Trump is kind of wacky, but he's, he's our kind of wacky, right? What matters more is putting a, you know, a Republican back in office. And they're not even Republicans. The Republican Party, as anyone knew it, is dead. And I've never been a fan, but these are not your grandfather's Republicans. I think we all know that. So, you know, it's pretty clear we have six months to change that. And we can change that. But we have to, we have to, we have to do a lot of work, right? And we have to examine what we're doing. Because I think a lot of the cycles are like, you know, a lot of the influencer crap that I've been involved with that I've talked about before, it's all about how many impressions a video's getting or a tweet's getting, but that's existing within an ecosphere. That's, that's, you're already converted. That's happening on Twitter. You're not reaching the people you need to reach. You're not reaching the MAGA moms on Facebook. Threads is throttling a lot of like, you know, that's not a breaking news kind of place. So if you're you know, it's fine. I'm not dissing it, but it's not something that's going to be like what Twitter was in 2020. And I don't think people are taking that into consideration. I think everybody continued on. Obviously, people reacted to Elon taking over Twitter, but strategically, the White House is on there. All the politicians are on there. All the news media is on there because that's what's paying, right? If you got the monetized account, that's where you're making money. So you're grabbing other people's content, retweeting it as your own, <laughs> which happens to me quite often. You know, they say, you know, imitation is a form of flattery, right? Or, but the rest of that quote is about mediocrity because that's always what sucks about it for me. It's like somebody will take your idea and do it not as well and you, they miss the, the core points and the truth, right? But that's a big industry, right? Let me tweet as much as I can because I'm fighting back and voting blue and all this stuff. You're retweeting it, you know, preaching to the choir and you're doing it to monetize your account. So these people are getting all jacked up on how much money they're making and how effective they're being because they're getting 100 million impressions or whatever in a contained environment that Elon Musk could shut off, right? He could turn it off on, in October. And then what are you going to do? Because Threads hasn't been set up to be an alternative. Facebook certainly isn't. Facebook's the reason, you know, he got elected in 2016 from misinformation on Facebook that Zuckerberg didn't want to do anything about. So you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and think this is your whole approach. I'm not... I'm not saying that stuff doesn't have a purpose and a value. I'm saying you don't want to end up in November like, I don't get it. I was giving money. I was retweeting the videos. You know, I was helping fight back and contributing to Lincoln's project and all these guys. None of these things have moved the needle at all. That's the other way to look at it, right? I know we all enjoy looking at that, and I've no, you know, I, I've talked about this before, but the percentage, you know, the poll numbers are still bad. And you can tell yourself, like, well, it's early and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, take all that with a grain of salt. Take the flaws in the polling and how few people are polled. It still shouldn't even be close. It shouldn't. And Biden's, you know, pretty much behind consistently. And I, I love Joe Biden. You've heard me make my case for him. He is like your grandfather. He's a decent man. He's an empathetic man. We're lucky to have him. He's doing an effective job. 
people have genuine disagreements, you know, with him back in Israel, any American president would have backed Israel in that situation. You know, it's Netanyahu you can't trust. It's not Biden. You can trust Biden because he did the right thing and stood by our ally when they got attacked. Okay, so if that's your whole plan for hating on Biden, you're going to you think Trump's going to do a better job. Trump, Trump will have Gaza leveled and Jared will be building condos there. I promise you, you know, so but anyway, I'm getting off topic and, and, and I'll get all my comments. I'm I'm just telling you like I see it. OK, I understand emotions are high on all this stuff, but what we're doing hasn't changed the narrative. OK, and I, I put myself in, you know, some of that group. I'm not doing it for money like there, a lot of them are. But, you know, I speak out or at least I did. I'm, I'm taking a break from social media because, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to bump up something that I think isn't necessarily a good thing. And I think we have to be a little cautious now, because if our whole game is a social media game, which worked in 2020, this ain't 2020. And that ain't the same Twitter, right? Elon Musk is suppressing any kind of content that has anything to do with progressivism. It's full, full of misinformation. It could get a huge bump if Trump comes back. You know, what happens when Trump in October says, I'm back? And then all the media is like, Trump's back on Twitter. Oh, my God. Can you believe what he said? Oh, my God. He said this and that. That's going to drown out everything. That's going to make all your impressions drop and all that kind of stuff that you've been relying on. All right. So you just have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of like, I don't want to trust any of this. You know, boots on the ground, talking to your friends, talking to your neighbors, educating yourself as much as you can. You know, on what's really at stake and how can you explain these complicated issues to your family, to your friends, to people that you know are culturally drawn to what Trump's offering, that haven't had the insight that you've had to see through the bullshit, that don't pay attention, that can't afford to pay attention because they're at work and they're taking care of their kids and they're going to their kids' sports games and stuff. You know, these are all Americans. We're all Americans, Republicans, Democrats. You know, it's, it's easy to get binary on, on <clears throat> social media and, and, and castigate the other side. You're always meeting yourself. Those are your friends and neighbors, whether you like it or not. You know, some of them are real scumbags and crazy and racist. They're not all. A lot of them are just kind of doing what the people around them are doing. That's how peer pressure works. You know, if you're living in Pennsylvania in the suburbs somewhere and everybody's got a flag and, you know, your father-in-law or your uncle tells you Trump's a good guy and he was a vet and a cop and whatever and you love him, right? So, so when he tells you something, it, it feels different than when somebody you don't know tells you something or, or says it to you in a way that makes you feel bad about who you are, that puts you down, that calls you a rube, that does all this kind of stuff, which I've done plenty of, those generalizations as a comedian, right, in my act. But one-on-one, -on -one, I got love for you, man. You know, who doesn't have people coming working on their house, mechanic, whatever it is, you know, lawyer, fireman, somebody, you can tell, doorman, this guy, you know, this guy probably... This guy's into Trump, you know what I mean? And you get in a conversation with these guys that isn't confrontational, right? But they'll reveal something that leads you to believe that, and you realize how much heavy lifting is going to be involved in changing this person's mind, especially if you start to talk about issues, because they'll right away hit you with misinformation, because they're getting it on Fox News. They're getting it in their podcasts. You know, They're getting it in the New York Post. They're getting it from their friends and neighbors. They're getting it from their mayor and their governor, right? They're getting brainwashed. They're getting manipulated. And most of the people around them are buying it too, right? That's the thing is a huge percentage of Americans are still into this guy, you know, 70 million. And you could argue with that number, but that's staggering. Cut it in half, 35 million. That's scary. There shouldn't be 500 people that don't know he's an asshole, right? But they're not, right? Because it's not just Trump. It's this machine. It's this messaging machine. And you have to, 
I say you, me, all of us, we have to find a way to reach our fellow man and say, hey, we may have disagreements, but this is not conservatism. This is not the Republican Party. This is not who we are, MTG and Christy Nome. Do you know what I'm saying? Carrie Lake, just opportunist grifter idiots that are disparaging our country, a country we've all sacrificed for if you've spent time here. You know, a country that doesn't just belong to, you know, white Catholic Christian conservative men. You know, it's been, you know, ruled by people like that since the beginning, since it was stolen from indigenous people and they brought other people over to do the work for them, or many of them did, enslaved human beings, you know. Like, you know, the, the system has been designed to protect a certain kind of mediocrity that you might have been able to laugh at in times past, but now you can't laugh at it because that mediocrity is infused with so much money from the one percenters, from the billionaires that have funded this sort of junta that they've pulled off from Tea Party on, right? From Citizens United was sort of the beginning of the end of what we saw as old school democracy because now you had this third entity here unlimited money in con congressional campaigns right in political campaigns i saw some statistics in ohio right they they looked at previous you know senate campaigns and it would be like four million dollars was spent i think the last one was like 60 million dollars from outside funds i'm not talking within the state i'm talking outside money that pulled into poured into local races Right. They went to red states. They imported candidates, which they're doing now all over the country. Maddow did a great piece on that. You know, they'll get a J.D. Vance and they'll move him to Ohio. You know, they get these carpetbaggers. They have the guy Hove or whatever his name is, Eric Hove or something. The guy from Laguna Beach, <laughs> you know, rich California, Orange County guy move into Michigan or Wisconsin or whatever running for office. Minnesota, one of those places that I never like to go to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're awesome. But um, you know what I mean? Outside guy coming in with unlimited funds. And that changed the game. And that's post-Citizens United. You know, that's Mitch McConnell. That's a Supreme Court handed you that. A Supreme Court that had been bought up by the same people that wanted that to happen. By your Harlan Crows, by your Koch brothers, right? So the, the people with unlimited pockets made it the law that you could put as much money as you want into a political campaign. You could use PACs and they could spend it on whatever they wanted, right? So now they'll spend $60 million in a race that doesn't seem significant to most of us or, you know, a race in a place that wouldn't traditionally be of strategic interest to outside forces. And now it is. And when you have an electoral college game where you have it, you know, 270 electoral votes and you're in, that becomes a very dangerous scenario. So you enter into that a third party spoiler where you could get you know, 269 to 269 or something, you could get a draw and then it would go to the house. That's how we got uh, Quincy Adams, I believe. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, it's happened once before where if it's a tie, the house gets to decide. If that happened in this case, if you had a spoiler, a Jill Stein or an RFK Jr. peel away enough votes to force that, who do you think Mike Johnson's going to pick? You think he's going to pick the guy he was eating shrimp cocktail with at Mar-a-Lago three weeks ago? You know who he killed the border deal for that would have benefited all Americans, right, on their big issue of the border? You know, and it would have actually lent some sanity to a crisis, you know, that needs government help, right? This is not a, you know, these are not evil people invading our country, but it's a situation we have to deal with in a humane you know, way so we could process this situation so kids and women and children are not suffering and, and adults, you know, and the people that want to come here and work hard should be welcomed with open arms, you know. Anybody who's disparaging that is an idiot because our economy is propped up by immigrant labor and there's plenty of room. What there isn't is plenty of money spread around because the rich 1% want all that money to rise to the top and they want to cut social programs. You know, and that's what Trump promised, too. His Time magazine was basically like, I will give you everything you want, rich people, billionaires. I will cut entitlements. I will cut all this funding. You know, and the guys that are vying to be his VP are proudly doing that. Ron DeSantis is cutting, he just cut health care in Florida, just kicked like 
a gazillion kids, you know, 50,000 kids or something just lost their health care through the CHIPS Act, where it was federally paid for anyway, for families that were like made a little too much money to get Medicaid, but couldn't afford the astronomical insurance on their own, like I can't, nobody can, right? So that, you know, there was a supplement where the government, you know, would give your child health insurance. They took that away. I was a kid who grew up without health insurance, you know. I got my first health insurance, you know, when I moved in with my grandparents, you know, when my mom could no longer take care of me. You know, I didn't go to the doctor as a kid unless I got sick. You'd go to the emergency room or something. I didn't go get checkups, you know. I'm, I did a couple of times, but, and, and I got okay. I got lucky, but, you know, imagine your kid gets sick, you know, gets chronic illness, gets real disease, gets some fucking nightmare thing that's hard enough to deal with as it is, and then you got to worry about how you're going to have him treated. And they're doing that on purpose to appeal to these billionaires that want to cut entitlements. They don't want a healthy you know, middle class and working class that has easy access to education and health care because people who have that will thrive and prosper and then they'll become lawyers and they'll become doctors and they'll become senators and they'll become CEOs and they will usurp you because they will see how one-sided the economic system is and how you've rigged it and they will find ways to unrig it and they know that so they want to cut it off you know, before it happens and have a bunch of serfs that are too powerless to do everything and then have one idiot in charge, you know, like they have in Russia, right? You got Putin. He holds it down because everyone's scared of him. And that's who Trump wants to be. And he's sick enough to be that. He's got no allegiance to the United States. He's got no allegiance to anybody else. No other human. He doesn't have any real relationships. There's no intimacy in a man like that's life. Right? He's as sick and broken human as we'll ever see in this country. He is up there with any serial killer. He's got a million bodies already, in, in my opinion. Because if anybody else was president, it would not have gone down the way it did during COVID. A lot of people would have died, but you wouldn't have Jared Kushner deciding which states got PPE protective equipment in the early days of it, you know, like Massachusetts had to use police escorts to secure their PPE when it was finally allotted to them, you know, when they finally flew in surprise supplies. I'm talking about masks and protective gear for the nurses and doctors that were on the front lines, you know, of a global pandemic of a disease we had no cure for that could kill you in a matter of days. You know, you drowned in your own, you know, your lungs, you know, it's just horrific. And I lost a lot of friends, you know, so fuck them. Sorry to curse. You know, we don't want to go back to that. We don't want to. So we have to be very careful about everything we do in the next six months. This isn't rah-rah, let's check out the horse race. This isn't normal times. This is anything but normal times. And the abnormalities are very profitable. That's the problem, is that the spin on... MSNBC and CNN and all these places and I watch it and you know I follow those people I, I know some of them I like them I'm not dissing them but it's an industry and it's it's captivating it's scintillating right how many podcasts do people listen to about this stuff you know I get it you know it's probably why you're listening to mine but I'm gonna rant at you anyway you know because that stuff while it's interesting is not the whole story of what's happening you know, and, and while that is happening, while a guy like Trump is creating chaos, we're losing progress as a nation. We're losing fighting climate change. You know, some of these tornadoes that popped up last night in Oklahoma are some of the most powerful that have ever been recorded. And they basically popped up without any warning. You saw a few days earlier, similar situation, you know, in, in, the, in the Midwest. Right. This is very dangerous. If, if you watch, you know, in Southeast Asia right now, they're having these freak storms, freak heat waves, 100 mile an hour winds, stuff that's never happened before. They don't even know what to call it. Like it's not even a cyclone, typhoon, like it's just what the hell is happening. Right. That's climate change. It's a bearing down on us, at least with Biden. He's attempting to do something about it. He had the Inflation Reduction Act which was a horrible name for a piece of legislation, <laughs> but a big chunk of that legislation was environmental stuff, which is the last thing that the guys who are back in Trump want. You, you want to th 
you want to really know what's behind all this? It's the oil and gas industry, which Koch brothers, that's what they are. They're petroleum pipelines. I've done shows on it. You know who they are, right? That's what they really want. They don't want a green president, right? A lot of the modern conservative movement came in reaction to Jimmy Carter, right? He wanted to put solar panels on the White House. We we're coming out of the gas crisis. We we're coming out of all, you know, just ramping up a lot of the instability in the Mideast. We had gas guzzler cars and conservation became key. You know, solar power was a big thing. No nukes, you know, which I cut my teeth on, all that kind of stuff, right? That was the same time the Koch brothers, you know, shifted from the John Birch Society of their father, and he was a founding member, to this new conservative, conservatism, right? It's when they started their political, you know, groups. It's when the Heritage Foundation started getting funding. It's when the Federalist Society and all these groups were created in D.C., these think tanks that realized they needed to, you know, change the policy, and that's when you had Ronald Reagan, you had Ann Gorsuch at the EPA, who's Neil Gorsuch's mom. She was the EPA head, fully owned by the oil and gas industry, right? That was a big middle finger to Carter and conservatism, and it's become a cultural thing, right? That's where the big pickup trucks and all this kind of stuff, there's dudes who feel like they can't get through the day without burning fossil fuels. You know, it's been equated with patriotism. Drill, baby, drill. That's the dumbest thing you ever want to hear, and that's what Trump's saying, right? And Biden knows you're not going to get, you know, you're not, not going to get over, you know, off of fossil fuels overnight, but you can at least bring the problem. Not at least, you got to do much more than at least, but you can address it as a nation. We'll never address it again if, if Trump you know, gets elected. You'll just have a dictator and you'll be going into a climate disaster dystopian nightmare. And if your state, you know, turns into a tornado alley and gets leveled, if you're in good with him, he'll send down some aid. If you're not so good, he'll throw you some paper towels like he did in Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria, another example of climate change, right? These super storms. We've always had hurricanes, but they get a lot more powerful as our oceans warm and he hated Puerto Ricans because he had a failed business deal there and he's a racist from New York City who was you know born in the 50s he grew up in the 60s you know he would use the s word on the apprentice spick that's what he would call Puerto Rican guys you know like who does that are you in West Side Story like you know but that's who he is right so he obviously you see how he acts you know on immigration right that's who he's mad at Right, because he's got this little dumbass brain from racist Queens, New York. He had an idiot father who was a racist, who was a tax cheat, who was basically a mob builder. All those shitty apartments were a way to launder money for the mob. You know, the five families mob. That's what Trump did. Fat Tony Salerno helped him build Trump Tower. You know, he did business with the Gambinos. He ran casinos in Atlantic City. He's as mobbed up as it got. But then the Russian mob moved in, and his boy Rudy locked up all the Italians, and they, they fell in with a more ruthless crowd that had ties back to Putin. And next thing you know, Felix Sater is working for the you know Trump organization and backstage at Celebrity Apprentice, and all of a sudden Trump is running for president, and he wins with the help of Russians. It's probably all just a coincidence, <laughs> right? That's where your model comes from, and that's what this place looks like. Do you want to live in Russia? You know, do you want to live in a country that turns its back on its NATO allies, as Trump has promised to do? The day he gets reelected, you know, he cuts off aid to Ukraine, or, you know, says, I'm not sending any more bullets. When they're out of bullets, it's over, and they know it. it you know, you read these New Yorker pieces, they're pretty scary. Like, a lot of the soldiers on the front lines are like, there's going to have to be some sort of compromise or it's just going to be a, a stalemate, a war of attrition forever. And, and nobody wins that. World War I. You know, they're fighting over one piece of land, going back and forth a few feet sometimes. Dudes would spend months in trenches shooting at each other you know, and gain it and lose it and gain it and lose it, accomplishing nothing but dead human beings, dead kids, you know, and they're not kids anymore. In Ukraine, they're like my age. There's like 50-year-olds getting conscripted, don't know what they're doing, sent to the front lines. I mean, it's a nightmare, you know. Putin's picking people up off the street, letting them out of prison and stuff, giving them money, 
You know, those guys don't want to be there either, you know, because they're the pawns. We don't want to be pawns. We're a democracy. We don't have to be pawns. We set this country up so we didn't have a king. That was the whole point. That's what George Washington did. He was like, no, you're not making me into a king. <laughs> you know, I'm going to serve, you know, a term or two and I'm out of here. That's how we're going to do it until Trump. You get him in there and that, all that goes away. Do you want to throw this away for that guy? You know? We're not all bad. I, you know, I talk a, a lot about like, you know, the stuff underneath America and the culture and the racism and all that crap. But we've given a lot of good things to the world. You know, the art I was talking about at the beginning of the show, those are Americans I was talking about. You go travel the world. They're glad, you know, not anymore. Maybe <laughs> they're, not, they're not super psyched with America right now, but our culture, they love it from blue jeans to Elvis to rock and roll, you know. We, we've given a lot in a short period of time, and we've given because we're a country of many different people, right? Jazz is one of the greatest gifts we've ever given the world. You know, I know it's not the most popular form of music, but if you think of what a beautiful thing it is, it's a completely American thing, invention, right? It comes out of the blues, essentially. The blues, a combination of Native Americans with African Americans, you know? bringing music over from Africa and, and African rhythms, you know, with this melodic sense that was already here in the Native Americans. And then you had European immigrants, Irish, you know, English, Scots with this folk tradition, right? And then it all messes, you know, melds together in places like Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta and New Orleans, the birthplace of it all. It's a gumbo. It's all these different things and it, you know, it gets mixed together and it's like nothing you've ever heard before, you know. That's who we are at our best and we're, we are that because of our diversity. You know, and, and you think about the people that, that gave you jazz. That's, that's, that's a black art form. You can't make any other case that it's not. You, all those different elements, but that's who, that's who birthed it and that's who perfected it and that's who still performs it. Not that Bill Evans and Jerry Mulligan, you know, Chet Baker, a lot of great, you know, I'm not saying only black people can play it. My point being, think of, think of giving a country that, that had done to you what we've done to our African-American brothers and sisters. Think of responding to the brutality and the subjugation that they've had historically and, and well after jazz was born, you know, and they're still responding with that. That should teach you something about what we're made of, about the human spirit, right? When a people can respond to such oppression and ugliness with something beautiful, with something that can help us understand each other, with something that's a gift for the ages that, that will heal you, man. You listen to Louis Armstrong, you don't feel better, you know? So you have to think about that because that's the arts, right? That's what the arts do. And the arts aren't just to entertain you. They're, they're a result of, of, of politics, of, of tough times. The blues came out of the fields where people were meant to work for no money. Not for no money. They were enslaved. They had no choice. Their children were not educated. They were just thrown into the field to work. Children, you know? Go listen to Buddy Guy's story, any of these guys who became these great bluesmen. These guys were working when they were children, you know, living in, in, in sharecroppers, you know, cabin, you know, nailing a, you know, a, a, a wire onto a fence post and plucking at it and coming up with this language. And they did it in the fields. The call and response was, you know, it was a way to get through the brutality of those situations and, and communicate and, and offer hope to their fellow man in that situation, right? And then it blossomed into this art form that's all over the world. You walk into any, any city in the world tonight, there's a bar that you could walk into right now where somebody's playing blues guitar that's playing licks that came out of the Mississippi Delta, you know, that came out of men who had nothing and responded with that, with a universal language of hope and resilience and understanding that you can feel in your soul, that you can express yourself with a language, you know, a language of the heart of the soul, right? Built for hard, hard times. You know, that's what Bruce would say about the E Street Band. When I 
when I worked on that tour, it was going to be the end. It was the reunion tour, and the rumor was he was going to, like, shelve it. And, you know, they'd do some corporate gigs, but that was probably it, right? And then 9-11 happened. And then he realized this band was built for hard times. This is, this is our band. And he wrote The Rising. You know, in my next gig working with him after that, I saw a bit of The Rising tour. I wasn't on the road with him. I was doing TV stuff. But I did the Grammys with him in 93. So, or not 93, 2003, right after 9-11, essentially. You know, or close enough that we were, you know, as New Yorkers, still very involved in it. And I remember sitting in the in the dress rehearsal before the show in the garden, and he came out with the E Street Band and, you know, played The Rising. And it was just, you know, it was like, you couldn't even describe it, you know? And with so few words, right? 50-pound stone on my back, half a mile of line behind me, I'm butchering it, you know? I don't know how far I've gone. I don't know how, you know far I'll climb he I just clumsily messed up that line but listen to the first you know couple of lines of the rising you know it describes a fireman climbing up into a tower and he talks about the weight on his back he doesn't know where he's going can't see anything it's all smoky can't see nothing behind me can't see nothing up ahead of me carrying this heavy weight in this hot suit don't know what I'm walking into but kind of feels like the end but I'm doing it out of love for my fellow man and my brothers. You know? A couple of lines. Kept this going. You know? That's what poets do. That's what art does. You don't have to be great to do that. You can do that in your life. You know? You can take these complicated things that we're all feeling and find a way to distill it down to a truth that means something to you that you can pass on to somebody else that can help tell the story. You know, I got to work with Leonard Cohen, too, when he was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. When I met him, he was like, hey, brother. That's what he said to me. Hey, brother. It's the coolest moment in my life. <laughs> Hallway at the Waldorf Astoria, you know. Hi, I'm Noel. I'm going to be your talent escort. Hey, brother. He had a beautiful suit on. Think the hat and everything. Suave as could ever be. <laughs> you know, genius, right? But he's got that line, I think, famous blue raincoat. Where he goes, I hope you're keeping some kind of record. You know, and Jackson Brown, my other, you know, like my mentor and who I worked with probably the most, would he would quote that line. You know, he said that's what songwriting is. It's like you're keeping a record of your own life, so you understand it. It's not about you don't have to be famous, man. It's not about that. It's about the doing it. You know, it's and it doesn't have to be music, as I said at the top. I'm trying to make a case, you know. For, for sticking close with the arts and using that as understanding, especially when we see what's going on in the world. You know, what, obviously they have chants and they're singing and stuff, but, like, I need some better music, given what's going on in this country. Like, I need some credence-level stuff, and I'm not hearing it, you know? So, you know, that's obviously a joke, but, you know, within that it is a desire to, like, find creative ways to voice what we feel and what we do, you know, because the brutality and the violence and the, the tumult and the, you know, the screaming, the, that plays into our enemy's hands, and, and we have to find a way to sort of rise above that, you know. We, have, we can never forget who we are in this fight, you know, and who we stand for and what we're fighting for, and, and the arts help us do that, you know, and love has to be your guide, right, nonviolence, love, you know, love for your fellow man, you're always meeting yourself, as I said, so uh, that's got to be almost an hour, I've been talking to you guys, I know it started weird, I won't play guitar again, uh oh, sorry, but, uh, thank you for listening, I'm going to come back soon and do another one. I won't do this cheesy ending where I talk. But uh, I love you guys. You always say nice things. It means a lot to me. Thanks for those folks who bought T-shirts. And if you watch on YouTube, there's a way to become a member or something. It's like $4.99. You can support the page. I'm going to set up a patron or something maybe someday. I got a lot of paintings. I got like 150 watercolors I just finished. I'll show them to you guys next time or one of these times, okay? Until then, uh, take care of yourselves. You know, I think it might be a crazy little period again. And, uh, you know, just stay grounded. Stay safe. You know, get out. It's spring. It's beautiful outside, you know. Nice time of year. Do some yoga. 
hang out with your pets. You know, life is beautiful. You know, we're going through tough times, but it's a beautiful world, and that's what we're fighting for. Go out and look at the blue skies. You know, smell the flowers. Be happy to be alive. Start your day with gratitude. As bad as it all is, be thankful. You're here and you get to make a difference. And you're here for a blink of an eye. So you might as well enjoy it. You might as well do what you can to help somebody else, you know. Put down your swords, you know. Pick up your guitars. Peace. That's it. Noel Kastler Podcast. Episode whatever it is. 110. I'll see you next time. Bye.